My guest today is Sam Dunning. Sam is the co-owner at Web Choice, and he is the host of his own podcast, which I highly recommend, called The Business Growth Show. It's a B2B marketing podcast. He is also an expert at SEO, so much so that he has an SEO superhero persona, which I'm going to ask him about. He is here today to talk to us about how to scale your SEO for free, three ways to build powerful backlinks, the importance of SEO for B2B companies, how to make SEO work for your B2B company, and a whole lot more. Let's jump right in. Thank you so much, Sam, for taking the time to talk to me today. I appreciate it. Cheers, Linda. Looking forward to the chat. It's funny because we spoke once before I interviewed you and I thought it was a long time ago. It hasn't been a year. And so I thought, okay, am I bringing Sam back on too soon? But you know what? So much has changed and so much is changing so rapidly that I'm going to justify having you on (laughs) before a year has been up just because I have so many questions for you. And when it comes to SEO, I mean, you're the guy. So yeah, I just have a lot, a lot to, to talk to you about. Always yeah, so, down to talk SEO. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Can we start with something kind of fun? You have your SEO man, that persona. And you also, for a while, you were doing like a 50s um, gangster sort of thing. Oh, yeah. I, I SEO just, fellas, yeah. What is that? SEO fellas. Oh, SEO fellas. Okay. I should, <laughs> I'm, that. I'm half Italian. I should know about that kind of thing. <laughs> I just, I'm really impressed that you took a concept and personified it like that. Have people like, has that brought people in or what impact has that had on your, on your business? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, right? Because like with any content that you publish on channels like YouTube, where we put most of it, as well as LinkedIn, where we cut up the shorter videos, it's, it's hard to say like the exact inquiry that that video might have brought in. But as with most forms of content marketing, it, I guess it brings people one step closer towards working with us so whether they found it completely stupid so maybe it put someone off working with me for life because they saw me dressed up in a superhero outfit as seo man or they saw me in a gangster outfit as uh, the seo fella himself or maybe they thought actually this guy doesn't mind having a laugh he seems to know a little bit of what he's talking about when it comes to seo and at the same time he doesn't mind having a laugh and joke so maybe it did take someone on the next step closer to yeah. thinking oh, as and when i need seo help i'm going to work with them so as with most forms of content especially on the social side of things, it's tricky to say whether that tips someone over the edge, but it certainly got a lot of interesting feedback, both in the feed and on DMs. A lot of people seem to enjoy it. And like you say, a lot of the content that goes out there is is a bit samey, so it's quite fun to both record those and publish something that's a little bit out there. I just love it because clearly you're an extrovert, right? Because you also had a post about having a party for 25 people or a barbecue. Uh, <laughs> like that terrifies that? me. <laughs> I I'm a funny one. Like I I don't mind doing podcast interviews and stuff like that, but face to face I'm not that great. That's why I don't mind doing video calls and doing podcasts and things like that. So one to one I'm great. In massive groups, yeah, not so much an extrovert. So I'm I'm probably somewhere in between, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Because that, <laughs> every time I see one of those videos, it's like God, I just I couldn't imagine dressing up. I mean, I'd be arrested, like just going out in my neighborhood. Like people would be like, What is wrong with this woman? <laughs> So I give you a lot of credit for that. But on the SEO front, so before I even get into a lot of the questions I want to ask, I have to talk about the elephant that's in everyone's room right now, which is AI. Mm. And I wanted to know what is the impact that AI has had on SEO and on your business? Like, what have you seen? As of yet, not a ton, but I think in the coming months, it will impact SEO a lot. At the moment, I mean, at the time of recording, we're what, June in 2023. So a lot of people, a lot of clients and prospects are asking questions, especially around kind of how content could be impacted because now there's so many tools that can produce paragraphs and pages of content at the click of a button or or a prompt in chat GPT or whatever AI tool you use. So there's a lot of questions around how effective that is. There's other questions around things like how is Google going to evolve its search engine results page? which is subject to change the exact timeline we don't know yet. But it's I think it's both good and perhaps not so good. I think the good part is that 
Google striving to give people answers to their questions faster. Mm -hmm. So rather than the traditional, you might ask a question, like let's say it's fitness based, like how do I lose 20 pounds in 12 weeks? Then traditionally you might have to trawl through four or five articles on the results page. Whereas now they might give you all the results above the fold um, without having to click through on an article. And then you might then say, look, here's two or three articles that expand on the topic. They're also bringing out a perspective tab, a perspectives tab in the next couple of weeks. And so you click the perspectives tab and that gives you results. So rather than articles, you'll bring up results like YouTube shorts or Reddit threads or communities. So it's actually giving you answers from the horse's mouth, from people that are ha have hands-on experience on the topic themselves, rather than someone that's just wrote, written an article that might not have ever actually experienced the topic. So from an educational standpoint content i think it's going to improve from a more direct standpoint i.e when someone's searching for a specific offer or service or product it might not change so much so i think there's some good angles and there's some not so good angles that it's gonna impact yeah. i'm happy to dive into those as you wish yeah well it's sort of like with copywriting and somebody had posted on linkedin the other day that there was a company that laid off all of their people because of, you know, the new AI tools. And so I, right. I responded with a, uh, by saying that there was a eating disorders site that had fired all their people to answer their phones. And they had to, they had a chat, an AI chat come in, um, in its place. And it started having, creating more problems. People were calling or, texting for advice and they were getting bad advice. So they had to get rid of that. So there's the humanitarian part, like as far as, you know, what I do, it seems like it's going to up the game for platforms and, and search engines like Google, you know, like what you just said. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, like I was saying, then Google want to give people the most relevant answers to their question. But that said, they still, I mean, Google makes a ton of its revenue from paid ads, so Google AdWords. And if they completely remove that above the fold section. And instead of giving you the ads, they serve you just answers to your question or relevant content. If they just do all that above the fold there, they're not going to really make the revenue they need. And so I think when it comes to kind of higher up in the sales funnel, when you've got initial questions, queries, looking to fix a problem, it might change a fair bit. So you might see the answer come above the fold and then you might see some supporting articles when you're perhaps later in the sales process, i.e. you're searching for a specific vendor or solution or similar, mm -hmm. I feel like it's not going to change the results so much. But from a content standpoint, as as you know, Linda, I think there's some tools that are okay in terms of the fact that they can give you, you can prompt these tools to write certain topics or articles and they could be a good starting foundation. But I think still at this point in time, nothing's going to be quite as good as a subject matter expert who knows the industry who knows the prospects, pain points that you're writing about, who can give that insider knowledge that's really going to give the user actually what they need and give them the, the details, the juicy inside, the info that they're usually searching for. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you still need that human element. As far as like B2B, what's the real importance of SEO? Yeah, well, according to 99% of B2B companies, SEO is dead, so not too sure. Wait, uh, <laughs> jo jokes aside... J jokes aside, yeah, it depends really. So, I mean, if you're if you're a B two B company, and providing that you're in a somewhat established market, i.e., prospects are aware that your solution is out there, then organic search SEO probably has some relevance. What we tend to see is a lot of B two B companies invest quite heavily in like paid ads or LinkedIn ads or trade shows. Maybe they've got an outbound sales team running cold email, cold calls, but Quite often, they'll just neglect organic search SEO quite heavily, which simply means that when kind of prospects or potential clients are searching for your offer or they're comparing alternatives or they've got questions around your industry or niche, then your competitors just are simply lapping up all that traffic and all those sales leads. And I think a lot of it is to do with traditional B2B models, like a lot of B2B companies are just, especially in the tech world, are following what's called the... Um, predictable revenue. And basically that is you hire a team of SDRs or BDRs. They generate appointments for your account execs by a cold outreach or similar. And then likewise, they'll do paid outreach, but they'll quite, they'll quite often neglect SEO. So it means that B2B companies 
in some cases can get quite quick wins just by investing in a good SEO strategy. So yeah, provided you've got a market, you've got prospects that are aware that your solution is out there, then SEO is a really good channel to invest in. Yeah, it just seems like every <clears throat> excuse me, everything that works, people somebody's going to say, "Oh, it's dead," you know. And I, I don't, I don't oh, know yeah. just to be controversial, you know, because it's <laughs> oh, well, what do you mean by that? Because they say that about everything, and I have learned to ignore it, especially on LinkedIn. Everyone's talking about things like that. So, how can B two B scale SEO for free? You talk about backlinks. Can you talk a little bit about that? What are what are backlinks, and then how can you know we use those? In short, a backlink is. Literally a hyper hyperlinked um, piece of content, a link from one site back to yours, and that can be as simple as a URL on another page of another website linking back to your site, or it could be a, a specific, specific keyword that you're going after that's on another company's blog article or website page or similar that links through as a do follow link to your site. And the reason that backlinks can be useful is that they are seen as a trust-building factor by Google. Uh, They can build up your domain authority, basically juicing up your website in the organic rankings, which is particularly useful if you're trying to rank for somewhat competitive search terms that perhaps have a lot of other competitors trying to rank for the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the thing with SEO is if you're in a very niche industry with perhaps little competition, sometimes you can get pages ranking page one pretty fast. When there's a lot of competitors, that's when backlinks become really useful. But yeah, happy to share some strategies that companies perhaps want to juice up their organic SEO on how they can acquire links for yeah, sure. little or no work. So one that I like to share quite a lot when it comes to building links, which is pretty free, it's just going to involve kind of a bit of time and a bit of effort is just like we're doing now, podcasting. Mm-hmm. So what that actually looks like is... There's a pretty cool podcasting site, and this this tip's actually twofold. So it's going to give you some good brand exposure and trust built in your industry, and it's also going to give you a, a decent backlink and help your SEO. So there's a site called Charterpool. I use all the time. It's free to sign up, and it essentially gives you all the top charts in each podcast sector. So you could search like marketing, technology, recruitment, all the different filters. So you literally go on Charterpool. You go onto the top charts. I usually hit Apple Podcasts, and then you can filter it by like UK, US. So filter it by whatever countries you want to target in. Choose your sector. Choose a sector that's relevant. In our case, maybe marketing or whatever's relevant to your industry. Then it will list out the top 50 podcasts in that niche. So you get those listings, and then all you've got to do is click into the listing, see who hosts the show. And then my recommendation is rather than a cold email, because most of us get a ton of cold emails, et cetera, is drop them a painfully short connection request personalized on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll do something like I'll hunt out the host of a show. I'll find their LinkedIn profile, just drop them a quick note, maybe say, look, I listened to episode 51 on this, thought this was interesting. Um, Would you be against coming on my top 100 B2B marketing show with a question mark? Something super short like that. 95% of the time they'll check it out and respond as long as they're active on LinkedIn. And then they'll either say yes, um, or they might say, I'm a bit busy, we'll do it a couple of months. So mm-hmm. if you make a cadence to maybe do, I don't know, five or 10 of those a day, you can easily work your way through. And then all you've got to do is, of course, is record the podcast. On the basis, you do a half valuable episode. This is taken into consideration. You know your subject matter. You can provide some actionable tips to the audience. Um, then when they publish it on their website, you can just ask for a link back to your site or a target keyword or target page. Perhaps they ask for something in return or something similar. Um, but yeah, you get a two hit because you get a podcast episode to show thought leadership, but you also get a backlink back to your site and it builds up your, your SEO. So that's, that's one awesome. of my favorites, but there's a bunch more as well. I've never chartable. So it's chartable.com. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to check that out. I never heard of it. So yeah, I recommend it for it's cool because if you run a podcast as well, you can create a free account and it tells you each day, it emails you where your podcasts are on the rankings for each country and each category. So yeah, it's a really, I I just get addicted to it because I constantly check where my podcasts are, like there's stats and all that kind of stuff. So That's awesome. Because yours is always one of the top ones in marketing. So that's- It's okay. So yeah, that's one way. And then another way, which is again, free and good in a a number of ways is partnerships. So seek out potential partners that perhaps serve similar type of clients. So as an example, in our case, we do SEO. So- we don't tend to do a bunch of content. So in your case, Linda, you might be a potential partner. 
Um, a LinkedIn ads agency might be a potential partner. A PR agency might be a partner. A CRM provider might be a partner, those kind of things. And they're going to serve similar types of B2B clients, like tech and service clients to us. So we could reach out to them and say, hey, guys, we, we kind of serve a similar client base. Um, would you be open to creating some content together, whether it's like a joint video episode or a joint blog article, some kind of piece of media, and then maybe you both create an article together and then you link back to each other on that article. Um, and what you can do as well is the reason this is twofold is the great um, reason for having partners is not only can you do some SEO work, some backlinks together, but you can also send lead, leads each other the way. So like if you get a prospective client that needs their offer that you don't serve, you send that to them and when they get similar, they send it back to yours. So it's like a two-way business yeah. driver. That's great. Have have you had a lot of success with that approach? Because I do look for agencies and there's a lot of them that use copywriters. Usually what happens is like, yeah, we'll keep you in mind and I touch base here and there, but it hasn't really been a, a big generator for me a couple of times, but not not a lot. Yeah. To be blunt, is there's only probably two or three with us that have been great. A lot have been similar, but then I suppose it's it's also because I suppose it's a two-way thing. And you're always going to get companies that are more give than take. Like, for example, we partner with Justin Rowe at Impactable. So I'll send his guys, like literally anytime someone asks for LinkedIn ads work, I'll just send a client their way. But mm -hmm. they're exactly the same. Like every time they need an SEO partner or web partner, they'll ping the client my way. So it's very similar. Um, so I think it needs to be give and take. It's, but like you say, it is, a, it is one way you have to speak to several partners um, because some people will give more than they take, but that's... That's the same. Sadly, a lot of people are selfish and that's the way it is in business. So you have to, it does take a bit of work up front. I think the intention is good. Like I never feel like someone has said, Hey, I'm going to, you know, I'll keep you in mind if they don't, but I mm -hmm. don't know if the opportunities may not be a match. Like I don't, I try not to take it personally, but you know, it's whatever. For sure. <laughs> you never For know. sure. It's like when somebody goes to you, it's like, yeah, what did I say? You know? And then people are telling you, it's just the way it is lately, you know? Well, how can SEO drive like high intent, bottom of funnel buyers, and then build also brand um, at the top of funnel opportunities. I suppose from a B2B perspective, most of us want to either fuel ourselves if we're just our, our self running the company, or if not, fuel our sales team with a steady flow of demo requests or consult requests for those buyers that are actually in market now. So most of the time that starts with getting as niche as possible. So you want to think about what are the main types of service or offer that we want inquiries for, and also what's the sub-segment, -seg i.e. the verticals or industries within that that we want to serve. Because a lot of SEO, a lot of companies when they start SEO, they make the mistake of thinking, oh, let's just pump out a load of articles, a load of blogs, and hopefully they'll rank. And there's, it's not to say that blog articles are bad because they can be great, but they're quite often for early in the uh, funnel prospects. So what you want to start with is thinking about like what are the main services you want to sell and what are the verticals within that um, industry that we can sell to. I.e. in our case, that might be B2B SaaS SEO services. For an accountant, that might be payroll for financial companies. For yourself, that might be copywriting for B2B SaaS companies. So think about that long tail niche specific keyword to that sub, sub segment of those offers that you want to create. Nail down all of those first of all and create a Service or, off, service or offer page for each one of those. Um, that might be 10 pages, that might be 20 pages, that might be 30 pages, that might be more. But a quick tip to kind of make sure those are actually going to have an impact is literally Google the search term, look at the top three, four companies that are ranking organic top three or four spots, make a note of kind of how their content's built up. Is it just kind of some tips? Is it perhaps they've got the problem they solve? Then they've got some information about how they fix it. Maybe they've got testimonials. Then maybe they've got a few FAQs. Look for angles, gaps in their content that you can improve upon. Maybe you can add a relevant case study. Maybe you can qualify people with pricing. Maybe you can add a video walkthrough, uh, a useful podcast. Maybe you've got hands-on FAQs. Maybe you can talk more about the questions your customers ask you on sales calls. So look for ways you can one-up the content that's currently ranking um, and then build out those detailed long-form pages for all those main services and sectors you want to cover within those services. And those are usually quick, pretty quick wins when you get that niche with the um, keywords that you can rank those pages fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And when I say quickly, I'm talking within like a couple of months, sometimes quicker, because mm -hmm. a lot of companies neglect that. 
once you've nailed down those main service or offer pages, then you can start working up the funnel or going for more generic keywords. So let's say in your instance, Linda, maybe B2B copywriting for SaaS companies, something like that. Then you might work on a more competitive and generic term like B2B copywriting company or something like that, where there's going to be a lot more competition, but it's just more of a slow burner that you can work on. Then you might go mid-funnel, like um, alternatives, i.e. company competitor A versus competitor B, or alternative to competitor Z, those kind of comparison searches where people are comparing vendors. And then, again, that can be a service or offer page. And then right at the top of the funnel is kind of where blog articles come in, which are more for building traffic, building brand, building awareness. And that's things like 10 top tips to do this or how to do this or it might be a problem search, like why isn't my website converting or why isn't my copy converting? Those kind of questions where you can get top of the funnel traffic. It's unlikely they'll be ready to go on the page, read the article and request a demo, but you can guide them to another resource. Like you could say more tips like this, sign up to our email or check out my YouTube for more details or check out our podcast for similar tips. So it's understanding the user intent behind what you're creating and starting with that bottom of the funnel people ready to speak to sales today and then work your way up. Yeah, that makes total sense. And the whole thing with niching down too is that people, uh, it's almost about finding your value proposition. You know, when you, cause mm-hmm. that's how I tell people like to really find, you know, what separates you is to find that gap. What, what are your competitors not doing or they're not doing well, or they're not talking about, you know, yeah. there's a lot of stories about, you know, the, what was it? Schlitz, the beer. There was, a, I've talked about this in other podcasts, but there was a famous copywriter, I forget if it was Caples, but um, that, you know, was hired to to increase sales for Schlitz. And he went over to the factories, this is way back when, and noticed that they were using a particular process that was steam cleaning something and um, their equipment. And he was impressed. And, and the person that was working with him said, well, everyone, every beer, beer manufacturer does this. He goes, but no one talks about it. So they made that the focus of their ads. And they like quadruple sales. They ended up being like number one selling beer because everyone did it, but no one was talking about it. So it's almost like you got to find those those little gems, you know. And so it's definitely, yeah, yeah. We always got to look for gaps or or think ways to stand out, certainly in, in crowded markets. And is there ever a reason not to do SEO? There is. There's plenty of reasons. If you are a brand new category or a brand new sector, i.e people aren't actually aware that your solution or the vertical you're in exists, it's almost pointless because no one's going to be searching on Google for the service or offer or industry that you're after because Mm -hmm. they're not aware. So if you're creating a brand new category, this is pretty rare, but it happens more so in tech, Yeah. then SEO is not really going to be worthwhile because you're not going to be able to capture audience because they're not going to be searching for what you do. You could go real high funnel and just talk about problems or questions that your audience might have. But to be honest, you'd be better off going directly where your audience hang out. So that might be you creating LinkedIn content and awareness there, or maybe through LinkedIn ads. Maybe it's being on communities that they hang out in, Slack channels, et cetera, or creating content on YouTube is going to be a lot more beneficial. So understanding mm-hmm. where the audience is. Um, the other time it might not be worthwhile is perhaps if you need results super, super fast. Perhaps you're a funded company and you've got investors that may be breathing down your neck, i.e. we need 5,000 MQLs by the end of the quarter. And if we don't hit that target, then you're dust. Then I'd say ship it all into paid ads and go outbound because SEO is, if you're, if you're trying to get results in a couple of months, uh, you can get some 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 results from it. But as a strategy, just going all in for a couple of months, it's, it's not going to be worth your time or effort. So th- those are a couple of scenarios where it probably doesn't make that much sense if you kind of need results super fast. Yeah. And when you talk about speed of results, because you mentioned earlier about it taking several months, I mean, what what are some of the parameters? Like when people say, oh, I want, you know, because everyone always wants results right away. And, hmm. you know, talking about the long game isn't a popular thing, especially when, you know, they have quotas to meet or, or whatever. What it, what are some of the parameters time frame wise for using SEO and expecting to see a, a shift or being able to test it at least? Yeah, yeah. So when you go niche, if you if we're talking about that strategy that I mentioned earlier with long tail, where you think about the services and industries within those services and, and build out those pages, you can if you've got a reasonably established website that's got a little bit of authority, i.e., it's been been online for a while, 
you can actually get those pages ranking quite quickly because I built out on our own website a bunch of pages like SEO for B2B SaaS companies, um, SEO for a bunch of different industries and built out these pages recently on ours. And I got most of them ranking kind of within a month. Wow. Um, the more competitive ones took a little bit longer. And likewise, I've done similar with kind of web development terms like web development for B2B SaaS, web development for B2B tech companies, all these kind of nuanced, quite niche searches, which don't have a ton of traffic, but they'll get a few visits and the click throughs that they do get are going to be high intent. So it's going to trickle through a steady flow of inquiries. So yeah, that that's literally hands-on experience. A lot of those I've had ranking within a, within a month. If you've got a brand new website, yes, it's going to take a bit longer because you're going to have no reputation on Google and you might need to kind of get a few links built, some content up there to juice up the authority. But some of those can be super fast. But as I mentioned, when you get into the more generic competitive terms, i.e. just two words in the search term, like B2B copywriting, I don't know, web design, accounting software. Yes, that's going to be a hell of a competitive. Those yeah. search terms could take years um, just because you've got monsters in the game. Yeah. And it's hard because even though I try to narrow down my niche to B2B SaaS, I have had many people tell me I need to niche down even farther. And so I'm still kind of exploring because I have people come to me and say, well, is that all you you write for? And I said, no, it's not. I mean, I'm working with a book author right now. I mean, it, but it, you know, so it's, there's part of me that's like, well, I don't want to turn off, turn away people. Cause if they're really interested and it's a match for me in other ways, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but that I think is the hesitancy, but I think, um, yeah, you definitely have to niche down in order to get the quality leads that you want. So it makes total sense. Yeah. So, well, this has been great. Where can listeners find you and learn more about you and your company? Yeah, appreciate it, Linda. So if if you want kind of more free SEO tips and, and website ideas, then you can connect with me on LinkedIn or check out the podcast, it's Business Growth Show. Or if you're perhaps a, a little frustrated that your website isn't generating a steady flow of leads from qualified prospects, or maybe every time you search for your offer on Google, competitors rank up above you, we might be able to help it with our unusual approach. We are over at webchoiceuk.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Sam. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Cheers. Thanks for having me on.